Hi, I'm Dan, Ham Radio Callsign, Mike Zero Whiskey Uniform Tango, and today we're going to have a look at this transverter I built, so a device for converting frequencies from one amateur band to another, and this is to convert the 10 meters or 28 megahertz amateur band up to the 70 centimeter amateur band, so roughly 435 megahertz. So what we're going to do over a series of videos is have a look at how I designed each bit and then perform the sort of simulations of how I expect it to work and do the measurements to see how it actually performs and make any changes as needed. So first of all, we're going to have a look at this section, the input filter. So let's head over to CAD, have a look at the schematic and then see about doing some measurements. OK, so here we have the circuit for our input filter and this is going from our sort of main power input connector over here across to where the regulators are that start generating all the voltage needed for our circuit. Starting on the left, the connectors I've chosen to use are and some power poles, just a fairly sort of staple favourite with radio hams. They do have a nice advantage that you can't plug them in backwards, so I haven't had to worry and design protection in my circuit for what happens if these are plugged in the wrong way round. You know, if you were using a connector that could easily be plugged in backwards, you might have to do some circuitry to ensure it could survive, you know, the zero volts and the 12 volts being swapped around. But given that the connector is designed this in, I haven't bothered. The first part we have is the CSD diode. So like when you get things rubbing together, this can often sometimes pull electrons off and this can generate huge amounts of voltage, you know, very low energy, but an awful lot of voltage. And you sort of get this, you know, if you ever it's a dry day, you can sort of zap metal, you know, door handles and stuff around your house. So that can often be many, many kilovolts. So what this diode does is when the voltage difference between its two pins gets too high, it starts conducting. So it clamps the voltage difference between these two rails. You know, the only real important thing to specify here is what its reverse standoff voltage is and its breakdown voltage. So its reverse standoff is the sort of voltage it will take indefinitely across its pins. Now we're designing for a 12 volt input here, but in reality, you know, we say 12 volts, but it could be powered off something like a battery where sort of a lead acid battery, you can easily get between sort of 10 and a half and 14 volts off its 12 volt nominal output. So we need to specify it such that it has a reverse standoff voltage bigger than that. And the other thing that matters is its breakdown voltage. So the point at which it, it guarantees it will have started conducting. So that'll be a good indication of the maximum voltage that it will clamp this circuit to. So if we look at the part I've chosen, you can see reverse standoff of 15 volts and a breakdown voltage, you know, it starts conducting seriously somewhere between 17 and 20 volts. And generally, because these ESD events are for such a short period of time, you know, we're talking single digit microseconds length events, you know, this doesn't have to dissipate much power. It just has to take a lot of volts for, and potentially a lot of current, but for a very short time. You know, there are other classes of protection diode that look very similar that deal with stuff like fast transients or automotive transients, but those are much longer on the scale of, you know, milliseconds up to seconds and can require serious power dissipation. But this is just so, you know, we've worn socks on a carpet, you know, we don't accidentally zap our circuit. Jumping over to the right hand side, we have a low pass filter here, and this is to block noise getting both in and out of our circuit. So we want this to allow DC to pass through because that is how our circuit is powered. And you can think of DC as just having a frequency of zero hertz, but all frequencies above that are unwanted noise on our signal. And we want this filter to block stuff either coming in from the power supply and getting into our circuit, or just as bad potentially getting out of our circuit, so noise that is generated within our circuit getting out to the outside world, given it's quite likely we're going to have other RFs parts hanging off the, whatever supply rail is powering this. And generally for this, the rules are, you know, the higher value the parts, the lower the cutoff frequency. So the frequency above which noise will be significantly attenuated. But there are a couple of gotchas that we'll get to in simulation. FL1 is a common mode choke. So what this is, is ideally all the power coming into our circuit, you know, the current would enter through one of these pins, go through our circuit, come out the other and leave our circuit. However, we can also have a additional return path or multiple just by sort of capacitively coupling energy from somewhere in our circuit to somewhere out and it sort of makes its way back around to the source somehow now, that's all very hand wavy because the way you get this these sort of signals back is poorly defined but it is generally that it capacitively couples two 
something else that is around it. So you might have, you know, additional wiring near this circuit, or it might passively couple to the enclosure and make its way back to the power supply. And because this has this sort of loop area, so it comes up here, then has this big loop that it goes around. This is will radiate a lot of energy, and we want to minimize that. So these common mode chokes aim to try and prevent that happening. And the way they do it is these are just two cores of wire wrapped around some magnetic material. And what you'll get is if you have the current coming in here is the same as the current going out here because these are wound in opposite directions. The magnetic fields from these two wires completely cancel. So you get no magnetic field across the ferrite. If there is an imbalance, so current is there's a different amount of current going in via one wire than the other, which means there must be a sort of sneaky return path via some other way, you don't know how. Well, then you're going to have a net magnetic field trying to switch the magnets in here. So as your AC signal changes polarity, the small little magnetic dipoles in here are going to switch back and forth, back and forth, and this switching action is going to dissipate energy. So what this is going to look like is a resistor to any imbalance in current between these two wires, and that will attempt to force current flow back and forth here. Now that, that's quite a simplified explanation, There's, you can go into a lot more detail here, but that's a sort of general overview, so it's to ensure that current going in equals current going out and prevent this sort of return path via another means that is capable of radiating. Given that in that case we then have this, you know, coil of wire around the ferrite, well that's an inductor too, same as this one. So if we put a few more capacitors here we can form yet another filter with these two capacitors and the inductance here, same as we have here. You know, capacitors are physically very small, so we can have easily have better filtering performance for not much lost board space. Common mode chokes, generally the only way you improve the amount of common mode rejection is by just having more and more of these and more and more ferrite that you have to switch back and forth if you want an imbalance in current. So this is more of a token nod, you know, I've not very carefully worked out the amount of common mode rejection this is giving me and how good that is. I just put something in there as a token effort. So that's generally why all the parts are there. So let's head over to LT Spice and have a look at how this circuit performs in simulation. There's going to be two areas that we care about, one of which is the input step response. So what happens to the voltage here when input voltage suddenly changes from these both being zero or unplugged and suddenly we have 12 volts difference appear on them so we've suddenly plugged something in making sure all the voltages behave themselves and then trying to measure the rejection of noise from our input connector to here and because this is an entirely passive circuit you know there's no powered parts no amplifiers then the amount of attenuation in noise we get from here to here will be the same as in the opposite direction so here we have our circuit modeled in LT Spice. Now this stuff in the dotted box, this is our actual circuit. And I have just taken this off the schematic. This bit on the left is our cable being plugged in. So we have a 12 volt supply that's always on. Some resistance and inductance to simulate that of the cable. I just took this from an online calculator. So this is an example of sort of half a meter of 24 AWG cable. This slot here is a two switches so these will close a millisecond after the simulation starts to simulate the cable being plugged in and we've got a couple of resistors these are just so this right hand half of the circuit isn't completely floating otherwise LT Spice has a little bit of a hard time working out what the voltages on these pins are relative to ground which is over here you'll notice that the two 22 microfarad capacitors I've modeled as the series RLC so resistor inductor and capacitor circuit and these values I've just taken from the data sheet. So ESR is effective series resistance, and you can see over sort of fairly wide band of frequency where noise and rings like to happen. We're somewhere in the region of 10 to the minus two, so 10 milliohms. And ESL is down here, somewhere in the region of five to 600 picohenries. So let's run our simulation and measure the voltage between here as our zero volt reference and here. And whoops, this is all rather exciting. So you can see the voltage here, despite being powered off 12 volt supply, got as high as 20 volts when we plugged our circuit in. Now this could lead to all sorts of problems. You know, we could have easily spec'd a part that was only rated for sort of 18 or 20 volts on the input, and all of a sudden we're possibly exceeding its maximum rating just by plugging it in. 
Now this sort of decaying oscillation is called an underdamp response or ringing and it's caused by when components that have impedances that are not purely resistive, so inductors and capacitors, they have, well, if you have a circuit with two or more of them, they will have an optimum frequency at which energy is transferred back and forth between them. This is kind of like sort of hitting a bell or plucking a string, where if you strike it, you will get a note that sort of takes time to decay. And this is a very similar effect here. Now, while this resonance has produced some wonderful music over the past, I'm not really sure we want it in our circuit. So now we've seen this is the response that we get from simulation. Let's go back over to the bench and see what we get in practice. Right, so here I've got my circuit. I've built up my input filter on this test board and I have my power supply here. Now the power supply is already turned on at 12 volts and I've got the oscilloscope probe across the output capacitor. So if we go over to the oscilloscope and I plug this in, let's see what we get. So clearly greater than 12 volts as we saw. So if we have a look at our cursors, this one here, so we get 19.9 volts, fairly close to prediction. But if we have a look at our X cursors, you can see that our frequency of ringing is, you know, somewhere in the region of 23 kilohertz, so quite a bit higher. So let's go back to SPICE and see if we can work out where this came from. And the reason for this change in behavior is here in the data sheet. So also ceramic capacitors change their capacitance depending on the DC voltage applied to them. So this here is a 25 volt rated cap, but you can see at 25 volts, it's somewhere in the region of an 82-83% reduction in capacitance, so you're only getting 15% roughly of what it says. Now we're running at 12 volts, and this is equivalent to a 70% reduction in capacitance. Now this is not specific to this particular capacitor, this is not a bad capacitor, all of them do this. But you do need to watch out for this, because it's not infeasible that you could be running, you know, 20% or easily under half of what you think you're getting if the rated voltage of the capacitor isn't significantly more than what your circuit uses. So, if we plug this into a calculator, our 22 microfarads times 0.3, that gives us an effective capacitance of 6.6 .6 microfarads. And you have to be careful when you're designing your circuit that you actually base it on the real capacitance rather than just what it says on the tin. So back in our simulation, if I replace these two capacitors with 6.6, .6, our measured oscillation frequency was 23.25 kilohertz. And if we simulate this, you can see that we're now getting a frequency, if I can get these cursors to line up. You know, we're now getting somewhere in the region of 21 kilohertz. So, you know, this agrees fairly well with what we've measured. So given this is a problem, what can we do about it? Now, one of the ways we can get around this is simply to ensure we never hot plug. The reason for this is that to get a resonant circuit to oscillate, you have to excite it at its resonant frequency. And we've established for these that these are quite high, you know, tens of kilohertz. If we use a power supply or a load switch, so the components designed for switching on and off power supply rails within a circuit, they will limit how quickly the output voltage on them can rise. If this slew rate, so how quickly the rail comes up is significantly slower than the resonant frequency of the circuit, then it's unable to excite the circuit. The problem with hot plugging is we suddenly get the voltage change from like 0 to 12 volts, and the speed of that edge means it has frequency components at all sorts of frequencies, and it's very likely it's able to excite your circuit. So if we go back to our scope, I've, you can see the time base is much slower. This is on 10 milliseconds of division, because this is about the order of rise time of my power supply. And if I now do this by turning my power supply on, rather than by hot plugging, you can see that my rise time is much slower. You know, we're rising in sort of 15 milliseconds, and there's absolutely no overshoot at all. If I have a look with the cursors and put a line at 12 volts, you know, somewhere there, you can see that we don't really exceed this. However, assuming that someone will always use a nice slew rate limited supply is not feasible. So let's go back and see if there are any other solutions. Okay, so here we are back with our misbehaving circuit, and I said previously that this was underdamped, and what I mean is, as energy tries to flow back and forth between this inductor and this capacitor, there's nothing dissipating that energy, so it can sort of flow back and forth more and more, and what we can do is, by damping it, we, in electrical terms, we put more loss in the circuit, and this is kind of similar to sort of when you hit a bell, if you imagine sort of, you know, putting your hand on it or having a piece of fabric to damp it, that would have the similar effect. So, as an example, let's try upping our 5. So, at the moment it's 100 milliohm, let's set it to 1 ohm.
And you can see there, our overshoot's gone down a bit. We're now only peaking at 15 volts, and we're reaching a steady state of around 12 volts with not much overshoot. Let's up it again and see if we can get it to so that it doesn't overshoot at all. And you can see at about 2.2 ohms, we get no overshoot, so there is some artifacts of some sort of secondary ringing here. However, this isn't a particularly great idea. This resistor is in line with our main power supply, so any current that we pull into the circuit will flow through this resistor, and therefore it'll dissipate power. I've estimated that this circuit could draw somewhere in the region of 600 milliamps, once everything's running, and now we've got that running through this 2.2 ohm resistor, so that's going to give you somewhere in the region of over a volt of drop and some fairly significant power dissipation. If we bring up our calculator, we get 0.6 times 0.6 times 2.2, so I squared R, and you know, you're getting sort of three quarters of a watt dissipated in that resistor, which really isn't good. So let's put that back to 100M. The other thing we can do is we can up the value of the resistor here, because this is the main branch in which it's flowing. So we've put it back to normal and we're back to ringing. So let's up this one. So 100 milliohms, mm, not doing a right lot. Let's up it to two ohms, getting a little bit better. But you can see that we're having to go a really long way. And actually, as we increase it further and further, this stops being the limiting factor. And actually this one takes over. So we have to up both of them. And you can see that there we're just about getting somewhere. And uh, we're now getting some very fast ringing, so that'll be one of these 100 nanofarad capacitors. But the problem is, is that as we up this series resistance by you know deliberately putting an external resistor on that capacitor, then we're going to massively reduce the effectiveness of this being an LC filter. Its ability to be a good LC filter rely on having as little losses as possible. So this is kind of a trade-off we're going to have to live with. So let's go back to where we were, given we don't like either of these solutions. And one of the key things with these sort of resonance circuits is if you're able to form multiple resonances, normally the slowest one will dominate. So if we can put in another sort of capacitor here that with a slower resonant frequency than this, i.e. a bigger capacitance, we can possibly stop this being so much of a tr problem. So whoops, let's put that back to 10M. So let's, for example, put in a big electrolytics. So you can see we've got a capacitor there and we'll model some series resistance. And this is a aluminium capacitor from Worth. Oops, sorry. So it's 220 microfarads with 30 milliohms of series resistance. And you can see if we do that, that we get the tiniest amount of overshoot. And that is because the sort of the frequent, the ringing here is being limited by this capacitor. And this is fairly well damped. So this is quite a nice solution. Alternatively, we could up this a little bit, you know, something like that, and you can see absolutely no overshoot at all. However, I would quite like to go back to this part for reasons that I will show you in a second. So what I've gone and done is I've gone and replaced our DC power source with an AC one, and I'm now sweeping it from 10 hertz to 1 gigahertz, and we're going to look at the response of our circuit. So you can see here I've still got the modeling of the cable in, and we get 0 dB at low frequencies, which is what we'd expect, and then we get these sort of peaks on the way down. Now each of these peaks corresponds to a resonance or another. And you can see here that we're peaking at this 23.1 kilohertz, which is what we had in simulation before. Now, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of the effects of the cable. We don't want to be designing our circuit, making s assumptions about the cable. So if we take all that out, this should be our worst case. And you can see here our response has got a little bit peakier, so a little bit higher in amplitude, but um, and change frequency slightly. So we're now it's running at mm, 27, 28 kilohertz. And I said before that, you know, we didn't want to increase R5 because that increased losses. And I also sort of hand waved a little bit that I didn't want to increase R4 and R10 because it made my filtering response worse. Well, let's have a look at that. So what we can now do is in LT Spice, you can set things to be parameters that change on sweep. So we set the, both of these to some parameter called R damp. And what we're going to do is we're going to step the parameter R damp through a list of 10 m, 1 ohm and 10 ohm. In case it's going to run the simulation three times with each of those values. And we concluded that we needed 10 ohms in order to not get any overshoot or a small amount. But you can see here, if we have a look at the legend, 
sorry, the blue's not very easy to see, but the green response is with 10 ohm, and we get this sort of ringing. With 1 ohm, we get this slower response, and with 10 ohm, we get this response again. So this is that high frequency ringing now that one of these 100 nanofarads is taking over. This capacitor, the capacitors are ending up so damped that they're not actually forming an integral part of the filter anymore. But you can see that this is much worse. You know, if we look somewhere here at 1 megahertz, this is a difference of this is 20 dB a division, so sort of over 60 dB around the 1 megahertz mark, which is really where we care about. So this is why this is not a desirable solution, and I propose my capacitor fix. So let's put these both back to 10M. And we don't need that. And we said that we were going to put this in. And I argue that it might be slightly underdamped, so we might see some sort of gentle peak, because we saw about 1 volt of overshoot on the time domains. So 30 milliohms there, and 220 microfarads there. And there we go. So you can see there is an ever so slight rise. You can see here the gain is ever so slightly positive, so that's where our 1 volt of overshoot was coming from. But you can see generally that this is now well behaved, and all of our sort of resonances, although it peaks a little bit, it's still well below 0 dB, so the you're not going to see any, the output voltage growing above what the input DC voltage was set to. And you can see that down here we're getting sort of, you know, these values aren't really practical, sort of more than 100 dB is possibly fairly ambitious, certainly we're not going to be seeing this sort of minus 200 that we're seeing up here. So let's go have a soldering break. I've got one of these capacitors and I will put it in parallel with one of these output ceramics and we'll have a look at the input response. Okay, so we're back again, exactly the same setup as before, scope probe on the output capacitor, but we now have our 220 microfarad cap fitted. So if we go over to the oscilloscope and put it in single capture mode, let's hot plug and see what we get this time. And you can see there absolutely not a trace of overshoot, zoom in a bit. And what we're going to do is we'll just repeat that again to make sure there's nothing that was so high frequency that the scope failed to capture it. But looking at this, I really, really doubt it. So let's go single mode. Now, one thing we do have to bear in mind, actually, is I've just unplugged the... Um, so I've just unplugged this. And you can see on the scope that we still have a substantial voltage there, you know, on the order of 12 volts. And that's just because there's enough capacitance and there's nothing draining it. You know, the only thing discharging this line is the scope probe, which is 10 mega ohms input. So what I've got here is a 1 kilo ohm resistor. And we're just going to sort of hold that across the power supply pins to discharge it. Now you should always do this through a resistor. Most capacitors are not spec to be sort of flash discharged or sort of to have an immediate short circuit put after them. There's all sorts of fun you can have with that. See Photonic Induction's channel on YouTube. But for now, we'll stick with a 1K and avoid any sparks. So plugging it in again. Here we go. Into single capture mode. And absolutely nothing, even on this scale. So that's that problem fixed. Right, so our step response all looks good. So let's try and measure the frequency response. Now, the way I intend to do this is I've set up a signal generator here, set to the biggest output voltage it can. And I'm going to put an oscilloscope across this output and measure the voltage here. Now, oscilloscopes have a high input impedance. This one with a 10 times probe on it, we'll have an input impedance of around 10 mega ohms. But actually, in this circuit, the value of this resistor here has little effect on it. One thing that does have a significant effect is that RF signal generators have an output resistance of 50 ohms. So we can model it as a perfect voltage source with 50 ohms of series resistance. And the reason this matters is that we saw the response to this circuit change, you know, when R5 was up from 100 milli ohms to just sort of 2 ohms. So this is going to have a big impact on it. The problem is, is that it's very difficult to get a high frequency source with a very low output impedance. Certainly I don't have access to one. So what I've done is I've redone the simulation with a 50 ohm series resistor here. So generally all the resonances will be slightly more damped. You know, there's a lot more damping going on here. But I'm then going to argue that what I, if what I measure matches the simulation with this 50 ohm, then the performance I'm going to get when this is a power supply and has much lower output resistance is going to match the simulation well. And that's about as good as I can do. So I've done that two ways, one with a signal generator and an oscilloscope to allow me to measure low frequencies. 
and the other way with a VNA, so a device designed to measure effectively the attenuation or gain of a circuit, and hopefully in this case it's attenuation, between two points. So I've put the VNA here, so it's injecting a signal here, and telling me what the output is relative to that. In the case of VNA, that will present a 50 ohm load, but this isn't really a problem, and it had very negligible effect on the simulation. So, going over to my results, you can see here what I have in orange was my simulated results, and you, I've sort of stopped here because it was going off to ridiculous numbers that I have no way to measure. In blue we have what I measured using the signal generator and the oscilloscope, and you can see that these generally agree very well. There's a bit of additional loss with the oscilloscope, that could be for a couple of reasons, not least of which is in my test setup I'm adapting the well-controlled 50 ohm controlled impedance output of a signal generator to banana plugs to power poles, so there's probably additional loss there. But generally these agree very well, until you see the oscilloscope response flatten out. And the reason for this is that I was putting in a signal, you know, of a couple of volts peak to peak was what I could generate, and my oscilloscope has a self noise, so a noise just of the channel with n absolutely no input signal, or even the input signal shorted, of somewhere in the region of 10 millivolts. And if you run the numbers on, you know, 3 volts peak to peak in for te and 10 millivolts of noise, you get about 50 dB of insertion loss. So what we're measuring here isn't actually the rejection of my filter, it's just the noise of my oscilloscope by itself. I then tried to measure it on a VNA as well. And you see this, this goes to, you know, this starts fairly higher in frequency. And, you know, it's kind of hard to work out what's going on here. Generally, when you see all this spikiness in a VNA plot, what it actually means is that you're seeing the noise floor of the VNA, so it can't actually measure the signal that well. However, what we can say looking at all of these is, you know, at low frequencies it seems to agree, and at high frequencies we seem to have very good attenuation, you know, on the region of sort of, you know, somewhere between 60 and 80 dB. The key frequency here is actually at this point, so this is 1 megahertz, which is about the switching frequency of some of the regulators in our board, so our board's going to be generating quite a bit of noise at this frequency, and you can see we have should have good confidence that we're getting you know 70 to 80 db of rejection which should be excellent okay well i think that just about does it for now so i hope you enjoyed this if you have any comments please leave them down below or i can be found on twitter or mastodon at m0wut otherwise thanks very much for joining me and i hope to catch you in the next one seven three